I borrowed this from a local farmer. I have to bring it back afterwards. 2.8. 2.8, that's my number. If everybody would consume like me, we would need 2.8 Earth to survive. You may think that I'm an over-consumer, and I think that myself also every once in a while. But the global average is 1.4. So that means with all the population we have around the world, and of course people in some regions consume more than in other regions, we cannot sustain the current Earth. And we cannot use the resources of Earth to actually survive. That's today. Today we have 7 billion people. So what do we do when we have 9 billion people? And if they all start to consume like us, I think we're heading for a really big problem. But I don't want to talk you down today because I think we have a solution. But it just means that we have to do it all together. We have to adopt, let's say, new technologies and actually work differently. So what we really should do is run our economy differently. We currently run our economy as a linear economy. We should be open, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think there are technologies, and I will give you just an example of one particular technology that we have developed, together with all kinds of people that helped us with that, to solve this. And the third thing is, that I mentioned before, we have to do this all together. So it means not just the scientists which I represent, not just the companies that I work for, for instance, but also you as a consumer. And it really takes an effort that we should do together. So this is the way we do it currently. We take resources, we make a product, and we dump it. And there's a lot of ways that we generate, of course, with uh, maintaining our current way of living. And that's not sustainable, as you will realize uh, from my brief introduction. So what we should do is think more about circular economies. And that means that we should recycle things, reuse as much as possible, and really think about the resources that we use. And we already bring bottles back to the, to the, uh, uh, to the um, shop where we bought them, eh? to the grocery store. So PET bottles. We also bring glass back. Eh? We have it recycled. And if we have biological uh, ways such as such a plant, we have it up for composting, and we turn that compost, of course, and we think, well, that's a nice circle. So we're doing already quite something, we think. But currently, only 20% of what we consume is recycled. That is by far not enough. We should do a lot more. So we really have to change from this linear economy to a circular economy, and also even have to do that differently. Because if you look at this, for instance, we have this plant. And basically, if you, if you take a look at it, if you take one out, I have to be a bit graphical here, I'm sorry. This is the part we eat. And actually, you could say this is the part that cattle eh, and pigs eat, because we use it as, as, uh, as feed. And this is the thing we are not using. So part of the plant, we're actually mixing again with the soil to make sure that soil remains fertile. But there is an excess of that, uh, of that plant, basically, to do that. So the plant is really a, a very interesting resource, because it is green. It is recycled CO2 from the, from the sky, basically, taking it eh, with sunlight, turning it into a plant. And if we only do composting, so what happens in this particular situation, if you do composting, of course you turn the plant back to CO2 and minerals. You should bring the minerals back to the land where the farmer has grown this, uh, this uh, particular corn plant, and that's very good. But the rest of the plant is turned into CO2, so it goes back into the nature, making a perfect cycle. Sounds fantastic, hey? Eh? You have a circular way of doing this. But in essence, it's, it's not really the most optimal situation. Because there are a couple of things that are happening. This plant contains a lot of valuable raw materials. If we turn it back into CO2, it basically goes back to this single molecular compound, and we can use some of the materials in the plant. So the value in the plant is much more higher than this CO2. The other thing is, if you compost the plant like we do now, if there is sufficient oxygen, everything is turned into CO2 and minerals. But typically, there's not enough oxygen when this happens in your compost uh, container. What then happens is that methane is formed. 
so CH4. Methane is a 25 times more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So if we turn actually the plant into methane in a compost uh, container, we're creating another environmental issue. So we should do this differently. And we looked at it very closely. How can we do this in a proper way? Use this fantastic feedstock that we currently use for food production. So we should have food production of agriculture, of course, is our primary purpose. We need to find ways to feed 9 billion people. So that's our primary purpose. But what can we do better with the waste material? And don't call it a waste anymore. It's a resource. Sorry about that. It is quite a lot. If you look at the weight of the thing that I just thrown in, the corn cob, it's around the same weight as the plant I have here right now. We're basically not using that, that uh, carbon right now. So what we had in mind is, and I will show you just a case of biofuels, so-called second generation biofuels, using this part of the plant. So not the corn cob, the corn cob is food, as you remember, but this part of the plant as a resource for making biofuels. And that's not easy at all. And science came to the rescue. So how can you do this? And it actually solves a debate that we have for quite a while already, and that's this food versus fuel debate. If we do this right, we're not talking food versus fuel, then we're using the same amount of land for food and fuel. Technically, it can be done. We just have to make the mind switch and use that technology that, that is out there. So what actually led to this inspiration? Scientists took a look at nature and see how does nature degrade cellulosic fibers. You see wood in the forest being degraded by fungi. You see it in a compost hive as an illustration that you see here. There are enzymes and fungi working together to degrade these feedstocks. And this is a particular nice one because, as I said before, the, the compost hive turns it really into CO2. So what you should do is use the systems in a compost hive but make sure it, it stops at the sugars. And because 70% of what a plant is, is actually sugars. And cellulose and hemicellulose, and those are very valuable compounds to start to do all kinds of synthesis with. So this compost hive is an example there where scientists found, yeah, scientists from our company, by the way, found enzymes that work at 60 to 70 degrees to degrade this cellulosic material. And interestingly, if you do that, by operating at 60 to 70 degrees, other microorganisms cannot grow in, under those conditions. So the sugars that you make are not being consumed by others, which is, of course, very important. So the sugars that you get out of this are a very complex mix of sugars, and they look a lot like what you see here. They're actually not suited for human consumption. There are compounds in there that don't make it taste well, and it's basically not allowed for, for human consumption. Even the traditional yeast, and I'm talking about uh, uh, ethanol as a case, normal yeast doesn't take these types of sugars, and we use yeast to make bioethanol. So there's another problem. Well, scientists came up with a solution, and that solution came from a somewhat awkward source, I must add, and it's in here. And what it is, is it's dung of an elephant. Anybody want to? Uh... No? You want? <laughs> so in this dung of an elephant, and, and actually we should have dried it before, uh, it's still a little bit wet, but it's <laughs> as fresh as it is. There are microorganisms in here that actually help the elephant. The elephant eats a lot of hay, right? So they eat a lot of biomass. And then the biomass in the gut of the elephant is turned in, into those sugars. And there are microorganisms that can turn the, those sugars into amino acids. And that allows the elephant to grow to such a fantastic animal. So there are enzymes in here that are really helping that process. And people from the University of Nijmegen actually discovered that. And they discovered the enzyme. And there were researchers at the University of Delft that took, uh, yeah, let me do this, because I, I have a clipper here and I don't want to contaminate it with something for the next speaker, huh? <laughs> so researchers from the University of Delft came to the idea, what if we bring these enzymes from an elephant into a yeast, and then the yeast would suddenly al be allowed to actually take these sugars that we have as a hydrolysate from that plant to make bioethanol. So this is the dung that you, yeah, as you've seen, from the, from the elephant. So by doing that, we now have a yeast strain that can make ethanol out of a sugar 
that is no longer a sugar that is fit for human consumption, but a sugar that we get from a waste material. And that waste material we're currently not using. So we turn waste into a valuable product. And this is an example of bioethanol. And it's, as I, called, as I said before, a second generation biofuel, not in competition with the food chain. So I think that's a good thing. That's making better use of the carbon in here than, than composting it. And ethanol is only one case, because you can program this yeast by bringing in other genes and enzymes so that it makes different products. So what you're looking at here is basically the factory of the future. So it's a programmable factory. You can bring in elements, you can make certain products starting from waste materials. And that's a very important development. It could only have happened because people that are, were working on parts of the solution actually found one another and worked together in this. So we have to do it in a, in a really closed way and really be able and willing to share also the value. And one of the principles of making a circular economy is that you don't try, as we typically do in a linear economy, everybody in that linear economy tries to optimize his own little piece and maximize the value. If we're in a circular economy and do this right, we should actually much more work together and also be willing to share the value that you generate. So if you're a farmer or somebody in forestry, you should actually profit from these developments. So it generates additional income to the farmer. You as a consumer should accept the products and buy these products, of course. And if they're green, and you know that they're really green, eh? please don't forget certification, you should be willing and able to buy those. Also scientists and people that have parts of solutions should work together to make this happen. So basically, there are a lot of stakeholders, politicians, enabling this. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we, we need to do together. And it's you as well. So no matter where you are and what you do, we all have a stake in this, because it is very important to move to a circular economy. I explained to you, my 2.8 and the 1.4 of the world are not sustainable. So we have to do something about that. It may take time, but I'm convinced we can bring my 2.8 and the, and the 1.4 of the world back to 1, where it needs to be. Together we can make things happen, and I th I'm pretty sure that we will be able to do that and make the world a better place for ourselves, but also for the children of our children. And if you are willing and able to help me, please come to the canteen later on and shake my hand. I will wash them first. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you very much.